Hi, I'm Mary Alice Haney. And I'm Dr. Thais Aviabadi. We have two of my favorite people on the podcast today. My wonderful patient, Tony Braxton, and my colleague, Dr. Dan Wallace. Today, we'll be talking about lupus, a condition that has affected so many women, including Tony Braxton, for years. Dr. Wallace is Tony's expert rheumatologist. He's a lupus specialist who's made significant contributions to understanding and treating autoimmune diseases. Thanks for watching SheMD. This podcast is for educational and entertainment purposes only. It is not intended as a substitute for a physician's medical advice. You should regularly consult your medical provider in matters relating to your own health. Even though we share our honest beliefs on SheMD, some of the products and services we discuss may involve sponsorships or paid advertising. Okay, I have lived in this town for 30 years, and it's very, very rare that I get a little starstruck. And I got to tell you, I have made out to so many of your songs, Mrs. Braxton. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm so excited to go see your residency in Vegas at the Cosmopolitan Hotel. Thais and I are going to go see it together. <laughs> I am such a fan. We have... The, one of the greatest R&B singers of all time mm -hmm. sitting here using her voice to talk about lupus. Absolutely. And we're joined with her amazing doctor who is the, the, the expert in lupus, Dr. Daniel Wallace. And this is such an amazing episode. And we're going to talk about lupus. We're going to talk about what it is. We're going to talk about pregnancy and lupus. I know that we get so many questions about that. So thank you both so much for being here. And of we're just course. so excited. Of course. Can we kind of talk about how y'all met and your journey with lupus? Yes. Um, I, can I go first? Absolutely. Go first. I met Dr. Wallace in 2007 after years of trying to figure out what was wrong with me. Um, lupus can be very challenging and difficult to diagnose because everything has to line up. You know, it's almost like an eclipse. And <laughs> no one could find out what was wrong with me. Okay, so she has this double strand DNA, DNA, ANA issue. She has pericarditis. Um, just a lot of things going, in my, going on in my body and no one could diagnose me except for this man right here. How many doctors did you see? Oh, at least six. So I think what happened was that you were performing in... Vegas. No, before that, in New York. Yes, yes. She was, love how he yes. remembers better than <laughs> That's why I love them, you know? You exactly. were performing um, Beauty and the Beast. Yes. On, on Broadway. Yes, absolutely. And I you love him. And she collapsed <laughs> yes. in the middle of the show. Yeah. And she was taken to Mount Sinai Hospital in New yeah. York where they found um, a large pericardial effusion and a low white count. What does that mean? She had fluid around the heart, and her white count was low. So she ended up not seeing rheumatology, but seeing hematology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they mm -hmm. thought she had a can cancer or a pre-cancer mm -hmm. workup yeah. for like two years. Yeah. And then two years. Yeah, a long time. But how could that be in a young woman with pericarditis and all these other symptoms? Like that's the first diagnosis. Autoimmune would come to. Yeah, her. it it didn't happen. Didn't you say that your systemic lupus loves my heart. Loves and it, it. It can attack any organ in my body, but it loves my heart. Yeah. And you said when your face is puffy, that means you're on steroids to help Often. control the autoimmune disease. So Often. I kind of want to just talk about that. So did you, you had surgery for your heart. You had a, a stent put in? Uh, about 18, no, 15 late, months ago. That was, that was later. That was later, 15 so, months so ago. Then what happened was um, three, four years pass. And then you were in Las Vegas performing. Yes. Yeah. And nothing happened those four years. No one diagnosed you. Oh, I was just sickly, <gasps> often sickly. What were your symptoms? Uh, my blood elevated blood pressure, tachycardi, um, fluttering often, uh, pain throughout my body, just uh, everything you could think of. Just no one could figure it out. So then she is performing yeah. a show in Vegas and also collapses on stage. Yeah, same oh thing happened God. again. Oh, my It's a great story. Yeah. And um, then you were sent to a hospital. And this is Tony Braxton yeah, doing Yeah, 2011 this. or something. Oh, yeah, my and I had to so, hide it. 2007. And, and so she's hospitalized in Vegas, and they have no idea what's going on. So um, I think it was through Jay Shapira. Yes. They the helicoptered her yes. to Cedars. Yes. And Jay called me in to see her. And so you know right away what it is? And then we figured it out, our team figured out it was yeah. lupus. So that's how I met her. That's how we met. How many years later is this From diagnosis? From the first pericarditis scare, 
maybe three, four years later. Yeah. It took a long time. And how many years of symptoms before the first time you collapsed? Maybe three, four years before so that. So almost yeah. 10 years. Absolutely. Yes, <gasps> almost 10 years. It's 10 a long years time. to get a diagnosis right. for lupus. Yes. Wow. And you have two boys. I have two so, sons. So Sam you were Diesel. able to go through pregnancy. I did not, I didn't have kids and when I, when it first happened, when I first had the symptoms, and when I did Beauty and the Beast and I eat it, then I had my kids. And I thought, oh, I'm just a new mom. I'm tired. I'm fatigued. You know, this feeling in my chest is just, uh, just working too hard. I'm, doing, I'm burning the candle at both ends. And no one could figure it out. I just thought it was being a new mom and Wait, working. The collapse, the second time you collapsed, you had children I had already. my kids, yeah. Oh, wow. And I'm so a workforce. So what happens? I'm a workforce. You go to Cedars. Okay, so there's a sort of a disease named after Tony. So... <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Well, oh, yeah. There is, <laughs> there is a condition that Tony helped discover called microvascular angina. Microvascular angina is Prince Metals. It's where you have chest pain with normal coronary arteries. Right. So um, Dan Berman at Cedars and his group was, was doing spec adenosine imaging with Jay and found that she had um, something called reversible hypoperfusion where she was having intermittent spasm in the coronary right. arteries. And, uh, and the lupus was causing that. And the lupus was causing that. It's called Raynaud's of the heart. Right. Wow. And then we got our division involved and we actually found 20 people and wrote it up. Mm -hmm. And it was your efforts that allowed us to identify this subset. And now everybody knows about it. It's, you know, chest pain. You know, chest pain is one of the most common reasons why lupus patients go to emergency rooms. And a lot of the times, a lot of the time they have normal uh, findings. In, findings. So what are they given? They're told they have costochondritis. They're given uh, Norco and Vicodin yes, and sent that. home. Right. Wow. And then, Tony, when we found that she had phospholipid antibodies, started having multiple pulmonary emboli. How many pulmonary emboli have you had? Four. Yeah. So. Wait, so explain that. So so basically, you discover this, and mm -hmm. then you start having— As it. part of the workup, we discovered she was throwing blood clots. And you have her lungs. I had to no idea. Lungs. I had a really bad headache one day. I called— Dr. Wallace, he was on his way to London to see his beautiful grandbabies. And he said, how long have you had this headache? I said, it's just been since last night. He said, if you have it again, if you have, if it doesn't go away, go to the ER. I'm going to make a call. Just go there. And when I went there, I'm thinking, oh, everything's fine. They said, we need you to stay. I'm like, why do I need to stay? Well, you, you have peas. I had no idea. But if I would not have gone. Do you know how dangerous that is? That means blood clots in yeah, your peas. lungs. Yeah. And what do you do for that? You just yeah. put and on blood thinners, blood thinners <laughs> right, right away. Heparin. I was there for two weeks to get it to dissolve. It took a second for it to dissolve. And on the its own. only thing you had was a headache? I just had this crazy headache. I, I got so, when you have lupus, you get used to being uncomfortable a little bit, right. which is terrible. So the chest, the chest congestion, whatever I was feeling, I was thinking, oh, just the heart thingy, or it's no big deal. Maybe the pericarditis is, is back. I didn't feel anything abnormal that I normally would feel uncomfortable with. So yeah. Dr. Wallace, with lupus, and, and we talk about this a bit, was that it, it starts to, to destroy different parts of the body. Yes. It, you know, your body turns on itself in a way. Yes, and And yeah. in Tony's example, it was her heart, but it can and happen. Her, yeah, her heart, her lung, well, her sticky blood. Yeah, very sticky can blood. Can you tell yeah. us, or for our yeah. listeners, what lupus is and how you diagnose it? So lupus is what happens when the body becomes allergic to itself. It's, it's an autoimmune disorder. There are probably 150 different kinds of rheumatism or arthritis. There's about 30 different types of autoimmune disorder. Lupus is the prototype because it involves everything. There are, you know, autoimmune disorders that just involve the muscles, such as myositis, or, uh, or the vessels, such as vasculitis. But lupus involves everything. So a lot of the research in lupus is translatable to other um, rheumatic diseases, which is why it's so interesting. How do you diagnose it? Well... You diagnose it by symptoms, signs, laboratory findings. From a symptom point of view, 
you don't feel right. But often you don't realize it. You know, you're you, a mom. You're a singer. You're, you're on Broadway. You're, you're a you're pretty just... young girl. You know, I'm supposed to look good and be good. Uh, so the symptoms are fatigue, Chronic. aching, low-grade right. fevers, mm-hmm. swollen glands, sometimes swollen joints, pleurisy or pain on taking yeah. a deep breath, pericarditis or chest pains, rashes when you uh, go out in the sun, um, migraines or mm-hmm. sort of um, mm-hmm. headaches. Like cluster headaches mm-hmm. sometimes. Cluster yeah. headaches. Mm-hmm. And, that's, and, and then when you do a physical exam, sometimes you find rashes or swollen joints that, or Raynaud's uh, when the uh, fingers turn different colors in cold weather. And then you do a deeper dive and you find that you take a family history. Oh, I, my mother died of uh, some weird thing when she was in her 30s. Or, or, and you end up doing blood tests and the blood tests show inflammation or evidence of um, a hypercoagulable state or sticky blood. What did you, your symptoms were fatigue? Did you like what? And then just headaches? I mean, was there? I had like just a headache. I, I never had that type of headache. It wasn't the worst headache I ever had. I just thought I was tired. I was fatigued, but I had the feeling in my chest. Like I said, I just, just dismissed it. That that's just my thing. I have lupus, so I'm always going to be a little uncomfortable. Um, so what happens when you're on stage and you pass out? When that has happened? No, like, are you what just are performing people react? and then all like, of a sudden you're I like, I can't what? even imagine. You go to a concert, you're watching yeah. your favorite person on stage and they collapse in front of you. Yeah, like, it was a little scary. I guess the, the, <laughs> silver, <laughs> the silver lining in it when I was doing the play, it happened as soon as I walked off stage. Oh, oh okay. my God. Okay. No, immediately I was like, I feel weird. And then all of a sudden I remember them, somebody lifting me up and it was like, I was like, what happened? What happened? I was really weird. Yeah. Okay. So there are 200,000 people with lupus, but lupus affects one in a thousand uh, white females. Mm -hmm. It affects one in 250 African American females. And one third of all lupus patients in the United States are African American. Now, we should say she's one quarter Jewish. (laughs) Because my grandma. Really? (laughs) My dad's mom. (laughs) Uh, Have you done 23 and me? (laughs) I need to do that. You know, I need to do that. Uh, Yeah, my grandmother is Jewish. Well, so then you also underwent a procedure after 80% of your main artery in your heart was blocked. So when did that happen? A year and a half ago. A year and a half ago. That just happened. Yeah, really scary moment. Um, my sister had just passed. I'm and sorry. I thought you. that I was just sad. I get really emotional. I hate that. Um, I was just really sad, and I kept reading about broken heart syndrome. So I just thought, yeah. oh, I'm sad because of my sister. You know, Takasuba. Takasuba cardio. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, think. I thought yes. it was that, and I went to see him a couple times and Dr. Shapira, and um, I kept <sighs> complaining. All of a sudden, my jaw started bothering me, and Dr. Shapira said, "We need to get a, a CT angio. Just we do anyway." He's a great doctor. And when I went to get it done, the doctor who approved me, because I have a little sensitivity to the dye. And so they said, well, he's not here today. He approved you. So we're not, let's wait till he gets back. And I took that as a simple, oh, that's just nothing wrong. That means other universe's ways of saying, you're fine. And I still ha- had that feeling in my chest, this tightness. Now, this is a deeper story and more honest story. I thought they were my implants. Remember that? I called I think it's my implants. I need to get these implants taken out. Maybe is that? And I, I read the studies on it. The implants give you ANAs, right? But no disease. But oh. I did every. I read everything I could on it. It's like there's nothing to support that, Tony. Nothing to support it. So I said, you know, I'm just going to get them taken out. I got them taken out. Still had that feeling, and I, then Wait, you had it. Hold on. I did all. You this. went under anesthesia. Yes. And no one checked your heart. I mean, lupus. everyone know I has I have microvascular angina. They know I have a history of pericarditis. They know I'm on blood thinners, but I wanted to get them out. I felt it was a health thing. No, so I, I understand, yeah. but lupus patients should get a pre-op clearance. I did all that. I got the pre-op clearance. And you clearance. passed? I passed. I was eating my best. I was doing <laughs> my curls and everything. No, seriously. How did you pass? I was doing, I did really well. I passed. Probably by the hair of my chinny chin chin. I think I so. I saw him. I saw Dr. Shapira. He was like, I don't think that's the issue, but if, okay, if that's what you feel, I'll let you get it done. The doctor was very careful. I got it done in Atlanta. But then I still had that feeling in my chest and it wouldn't go away. And finally, when my jaw started hurting, mm. Dr. Shapira said, I need you to go now. Call them called his office. They got me in the next day, went and got it done. And I should have known something was wrong 
Because it's like the doctor will be with you shortly. I'll be right with you. She always I says, know. if a doctor calls yeah, you, it's never good news. <laughs> exactly. The doctor will be with you shortly. Like, okay. He'll just have you go and wait in the back. I'm like, wait in the back? I just had a, you know, a CAT scan. I can leave. He just wants you to wait. Just check your blood pressure every 10 minutes. Which I thought was weird, which was weird. <laughs> then all of a sudden, so you can go home like an hour and 20 minutes later. And then I got a call from Dr. Shapiro's office. You need- but they didn't tell me anything yet. It's like, oh, we just want to go over your medications. What's going on? Dr. Shapiro will be in tomorrow. We're going to schedule you to come see him tomorrow. I'm like, everything okay? Yeah, we just want to, you know, we just, you know, he likes to check on you, him and Dr. Wallace. They make sure you're okay. And then Dr. Shapiro called me and it's Dr. Shapiro wants to speak with you now. And I'm like, oh, no, I'll see him tomorrow. Oh, no, that's for your pre op my pre-op and that's when I found out he had to tell me he was going to tell me of course by law he's going to tell me but he said uh you know the angiogram looked a little suspicious you just had one done about two years ago and it was we could see some differences but that doesn't mean anything we're just going to do a look inside you know and that's when um so they looked inside and then it was like bam we've got immediately and you're you're in twilight so I remember them talking (sighs) I remember this so clearly when they were talking and he said they can't get it through. This is bypass. I will never forget that. I heard them. Oh, oh my God. I heard. He was in a fugue state. <laughs> right? I know. I he said, because yeah, they don't put you completely under for right. that, right? Um, this were, What is that called? An angio? Yeah. Yeah, and they went through my wrist, and they said, he said, the young guy said, this is, this is bypass. Can't get it through. Can't get it through. See, I'm trying. He said, give her a second. Give it a second. Give it a second. And he came over, and he talked to me. I remember. He said, Tony, you okay? You okay? And he said, try again. She's way too young. Bypass, do it again. And the guy went again and it went through. <gasps> I will never forget that Dr. Shapiro is always amazed. You heard that? You remember that you asked us to remember? You'll never forget that as long as I will as you never live. forget that as long as I live. And um, they finally got us through. Wow. And I stayed at Cedars for about two days. And um, they had to monitor, monitor me, you know, a real time. What do you call it? When, I get emotional when they. <laughs> When they go to check, you know, just to make sure. I had a little tachycardia for a while. Yeah. I had to go to cardiac rehab for about six months. But it was a very scary moment in my life. And I'll never forget that. Because sometimes people think they're helping you, but they actually scare you sometimes. It's like, oh, my God, you would have been meeting your sister. or Your sister was watching oh you. Oh, my God. <laughs> you're lucky to be alive. And that kind of stuck with me. Especially when, when you're a mom. Told me that, yeah. How did you lose your sister? Can you share? What, is my it, was sister, it the same Tracy, issue? she died of esophageal cancer. She wow. went during COVID. She went to the hospital. She thought she had COVID because she felt weird. Like, was she a smoker? Weird. Not a smoker. She was on all kind of, because it was COVID, you know, yeah. we'll give you some Prolisec. It's probably acid reflux. She's always complained of it. But she said she felt weird. She went to the ER and they kept her a couple of days. And I said, well, you don't have COVID, but you have stage four esophageal cancer. Stage four. So that's how she found out. Just like that. She went thinking she had COVID. But if it wasn't for COVID, she would have went to the doctors and they would have done a test and did, right. you know, Right. But this happened to so many during patients COVID, during COVID. So. I worked with an ophthalmologist. Yeah. He said so many of his patients lost their vision because they yeah. couldn't come out and go see a doctor. Yeah. We were working. Were you working? We were working. I, I yeah. worked more during COVID than I've ever worked in my life. Did you have a hard time getting pregnant with lupus? Or did you, did you, were you, were you her, were you guys together? No, that was before. That was yeah. before. Okay. Yeah, I um, had two pregnancies. And my third pregnancy, I uh, was had to term. It was terminating itself, I should say. So I had to end up getting a DNC as a result. But I remember the doctor saying, "Your look at your levels there. You won't survive the pregnancy." And that was because the, of the lupus. Because of the lupus. Let yeah. me ask you: With the first two pregnancies, did you have any complications? Yes. High blood pressure. Tell all us. All kind of stuff. All kind of. Con- but I didn't know I had lupus then. Had That's no idea. What, yes. Yeah. High blood pressure. The, they were trying. The kids were trying to come early. They said my my body couldn't carry it. They didn't know what was wrong. I remember one time that I my was like one centimeter at like five months. And they had to slow it down. They had to do it for both of my pregnancies, but they had to slow it down. Slow Lupus it down. patients are at risk of preterm yes. labor and they preterm are. delivery. Yeah. Yes. Especially how big for the were your or how little were your uh, babies? The oldest was like five pounds something, and the second one was six. But I remember they, I was probably two weeks early. I had C sections, um, and they said we need to let's get them out a little earlier. So what would you yeah. have done if she had been your patient back then? Well, we probably would have given her steroids which she's always resisted, and played yeah. games. Yes. The, Tony's favorite comment is, I want to give you this. Well, give me half. Always bargain. <laughs> <laughs> always bargain. 
dragon. Well, because steroids. she's a performer, and steroids can tend to sometimes it make does. you bloated. And then, the, you know, the world is so, you know, you, on social media and the trolls and all that, and you're yeah. like, which is why I'm so grateful that you're being so public about this, yeah. because, you know, nobody knows what's going on in someone's life. That's and true. and And there are so many people that have this and suffer in silence, and, and you talking about yeah. that. I, mean, I worked hard to hide it for the longest time. I was ashamed. Um, especially being a performer, so I would make light of it. Oh, you know, not Can you explain that to me, Tony? Why? Why? Like when I was diagnosed with breast, I'm I'm yes, nowhere I'm, close to you. No, it's but, all relative. I mean, I'm a nobody. It's all relative. But in my little tiny teeny weeny world, when I got diagnosed with breast cancer, the second I hung up the phone because they had missed my cancer, and you know, I don't know if you know, but I did a double mastectomy yeah, not to yeah. get breast cancer, and then yeah. my tissue showed breast cancer. And I was so frustrated. The first thing I did, I went on Instagram and started screaming, people, calculate your lifetime risk of breast cancer. If it's high, do something about yeah. it. But someone for, for someone like me, you know, it was my mission to change that. Yeah. You know, for if I could save one woman's life, then, you know, I would have been happy. Yeah. But I feel like, and I'm surrounded with celebrities, and it's there's always a hesitation when it comes to medical or health issues. Oh, yeah. Why is that? I don't know. I was told to hide that I had lupus. Like, don't tell anyone. You'll Who never told work. you that? Management. Why you know, though? People, people Be get scared because around six celebrities. You can't celebrities. get insured. Nobody's going to get insured, and I couldn't get insured. Yeah, my I was president of the Lupus Foundation of America. And our problem was we had all these celebrities with lupus, but none of them would come out. Mm -hmm. You would not get work because the second I told I had it, I didn't get work at first. I did That's not get incredible. work at first. No one wanted to put me on a stage. Well, suppose she collapse on stage and insurance. How are we going to do that? And so I couldn't at, at first. I did not wow, work. Wow, you're so yeah. brave, though. Do you yeah. have it? Wow. But that's yeah. why I have so much respect for women in your position who use their platform to help patients who don't have access to a Dr. Yes. Wallace. That's true. That is so true. Tony, so how did it affect your mental health? Because I don't think we talk enough about that. We never talk about mental health, you know, and it definitely affected it. I had chronic anxiety. You remember that, Dr. Wallace? You always have chronic anxiety. I know, but it got worse. <laughs> it but got are you worse. surprised? Here's a woman in her position. She was dismissed for 10 years. I would be anxious too. Yeah. yeah. I you feel like I have trust. to hypochondriac. Like I'm just telling people, I don't feel well and no one's listening. Okay, I'll, I'm fine. And it doesn't have a look. Right. It, lupus doesn't have a look to it. Not to say that other things does, but we always try to fake that we're feeling great or we don't want to mm -hmm. worry anyone. As mothers and women, we tend to yeah, do it anyway. Yeah, it's true. It, it, it's, it's difficult. And I, for me, it's important that I pioneer and be an advocate and tell other people about it and talk about my story and hope, hopefully you can help someone. What but, advice would you give to other women with lupus and trying to get through it? There's nothing to be ashamed of. I think nothing. That's that makes me so sad, you guys. Oh, me too. We always cry on this podcast. Because, because. I, because I see this every day. I yeah. see how women are getting dismissed. If it's not lupus, it's endometriosis. Yeah. If it's not endometriosis, yeah. it's PCOS. Which I've if it's had yeah. endometriosis. That was the reason I had to have two C-sections because I had, what's it called, a myomectomy? Myomectomy is when you have fibroids. They yes, remove. I had that. Right. And so they cut so deep that right. I had to have a C-section afterwards. Right. I could never right. have vaginal birth. Well, Dr. Wallace, to all the women listening and anybody listening, what are the signs that you have lupus that you can go to your doctor and say, yeah. Dr. Wallace told me I have lupus? If you don't feel well. Yeah. If fatigue, unusual fatigue, is mm -hmm. often the first, it's what we call a protein called a cytokine mediated. Um, if you have a low grade fever, uh, I have people who say, well, I'm always 99, six, you know. I'm one of those. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, swollen yeah. glands, you know, even in, in thin women, uh, they can still have swollen glands that bounce out. Um, arthralgias or pain in a joint, not, not necessarily swelling. People with rheumatoid arthritis have swollen joints, but people with lupus have pain mm -hmm. in the joints, even though under the microscope, the two diseases look the same. Because a lot of what you're, I mean, I, everybody seems, I mean, every mother's tired. No, every no, mother no. has. This, this is different. It is. You, you mm -hmm. don't feel well. You, you know, know well, there's something. So right. it takes an average of three and a half years for somebody with non-organ threatening lupus to get diagnosed and an average of four different doctors. Yeah, that's about right. That's better that's than endometriosis. It takes nine to 11 years to diagnose an endo patient. 
in this country, 9 to 11. Mm-hmm. And what, what tests should a doctor order if you suspect you have lupus? I like people to see an MD. Um, I have nothing against MAs or nurse practitioners, but sometimes if these symptoms have been going on for a long time, you really need to have an MD internist do a complete physical exam and order all the tests. And believe, um, my mentor was a guy named Ed Dubois who wrote the lupus textbook, who I, which I took over. And he dedicated his book to my patients from whom I have learned. Wow. Today's CMD podcast is sponsored by Dreamland Baby. Dreamland Baby's weighted blankets and swaddles are designed to help your baby relax, fall asleep faster, and stay asleep longer. My boys are teens now, and rather than waking up for their midnight feeds, I am waiting up for them to come home at night safe and sound. When they were babies, my worries were so different. I tried everything to get them to sleep through the night. Rocking them, swaddling them, pacifiers, anything to get them to sleep. And trust me, swaddling a baby with a baby blanket is not easy. I would have given anything to have the Dreamland Baby sleep sack back then. So many of my friends rave about how it's helping their babies stay asleep longer. And when they sleep, you sleep. The Dreamland Baby's weighted sleep sack is now my go-to gift for baby showers because it's made of 100% soft and natural cotton. It's fuss-free and easy to use. New moms and dads really need sleep, so it's the perfect gift. Go to dreamlandbabyco.com and enter my code SHEMD at checkout to receive 20% off site-wide and free shipping. This offer is for new and existing customers. There seems to be toxins everywhere, and recently I've been trying to swap out my toxic kitchenware and appliances. Did you know that most cookware and appliances are made with forever chemicals? Gross. I found Our Place's cookware to be a non-toxic, healthy, sustainable choice, and they're also gorgeous. They come in these amazing colors, so you don't have to choose between function, health, and design. Their cookware sets are functional and easy to use. Our Place also has non-toxic appliances that are amazing. I started using their Wonder Oven Air Fryer to make air fried french fries, and my kids love them. Everybody knows that I'm not a great cook, so for me to make air fried french fries, it has to be easy. It also functions as a toaster, so we can use less space with our appliances in the kitchen. Our Place is a mission-driven and female-founded brand that makes beautiful kitchen products that are healthy and sustainable. Leading the change, Our Place has always been PFAS-free and offers the most durable, toxin-free ceramic coatings, offering a healthy, safe cooking experience. Find out why Our Place has 75,000 five-star reviews and can be found in some of our favorite celebrity kitchens, including Selena Gomez and David Beckham. Go to fromourplace.com and enter my code, SheMD, at checkout to receive 10% off site-wide. That's fromourplace.com, code SheMD. Our Place offers a 100-day trial with free shipping and returns. When I was little, I had a Shih Tzu, and my husband had a Great Dane. And when we got married, we compromised on a Bernese Mountain Dog. I think he won that compromise. Our dog's name is Whiskey, and he has the biggest appetite. There's been so many nights where we have actually caught him on the top of the counter eating the food that we made for dinner. Whiskey loves Sunday's dog food, and I love it because it's healthy and easy to store. It's fresh dog food made from a short list of human-grade ingredients and was co-founded by Dr. Tori Waxman. He's a practicing veterinarian who tests and formulates every version of each recipe. Sundays contains 90% meat, 10% superfoods, and zero synthetic nutrients. Dog parents report noticeable health improvements in their puppies, including softer fur, fresh breath, better poops, and more energy after switching to Sundays. Unlike other fresh dog foods, Sundays does not require refrigeration or preparation because they're air drying process. Just pour and serve. Every order ships right to your door so you'll never have to worry about running out of dog food again. Get 40% off your first order of Sundays. Go to sundaysfordogs.com. S-U-N-D-A-Y-S. F-O-R-D-O-G-S. Dot com slash SheMD or use code SheMD at checkout. Am I able to ask this question? Because we're women and we have this fantastic doctor here and this fantastic doctor here. But when you have lupus, does this stop working? Or is it just being over 
would stop working. You mean 40. <laughs> no, honestly, does this stop working? Is that a sign of lupus? Like it's sound of like, age. It's, it's the sign of aging. Oh, so that's not a and lupus thing. When it, it just might stops. Be. It when might it, be. I'm asking, does that stop working sometimes? Do you stop yeah. wanting to have sex when yeah. you have lupus? Okay, so that's a lot a of question. the medications given for lupus affect libido. Okay. And so, stress also. The okay. stress you know, you're put not on feeling well. Antidepressants. Right. right. Okay. Especially these SSRIs that may decrease uh Libido, stress decreases okay. libido. And okay. when you don't feel well, okay. that definitely lowers yeah, your libido. You get very tired and then you get anxious about it. Yeah. And then okay. it's a spiral. Dr. Wallace, what about new treatments in the horizon for lupus? Okay, there are 62 drugs currently in development if you go to pubmed.gov for lupus from literally a handful 10 years ago. Yeah. So we're looking at um, new mechanisms of action. We're looking at gene therapies. We're looking at cellular therapies. We're looking at um, agents that block B cells, agents that block T cells, agents that block uh, certain proteins called cytokines. We're looking at stem cells. Mm. Uh, we're looking at a host of uh, gene, uh, gene therapies. Is it genetic? Is lupus genetic? That's a great question. So if Tony had a twin sister in her 20s, when she was in her 20s, her twin sister, if she was identical, would have a 25% chance of getting lupus. Uh -huh. But that means that 75% of lupus is environmental. Really? How soon do you, how early do you diagnose this? I have a niece who was diagnosed when she was like 12. What's the earliest you've seen? Um, usually onset of menses and to the 20s and 30s are the major times we For see the, it. Yeah, it was in when, my 30s. When you yeah, go back to your, to your teenage years, yeah. did you have any symptoms now that you look back? Yes, I remember feeling chronically fatigued. It was difficult for me to participate in sports. Um, I remember I always had this feeling in my chest since I was a kid. Never knew it was my heart. And you said that you had a hysterectomy? Had a hysterectomy is, in my 20s. In your 20s. Is mm -hmm. that, Dr. Wells, is that a direct correlation? We see, we do see a lot of, it's just like, you know, how many patients do you see who've had appendectomy scars, you know, because they had abdominal pain when it was gynecologic? We see a lot of that sort of thing. They probably suspected endometriosis in you. I mean, I don't, yeah. I don't have. My, that's what I meant to say. In my 20s, I had the myomectomy and um, 39, I had a hysterectomy, mm -hmm. a partial. Because of they pain? Kept, uh, they had done so much exploratory and looking and cleaning stuff up. And they said it was just a mess down there. So they just. Kept my ovaries to try to give me some estrogen. Right. But to answer yeah. your question, lupus patients do not get uh, hysterectomies routinely. Well, no, because <laughs> that's not no, one of no, the no, treatments. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm asking that because you you guys have taught me today that it can, it can uh, like attack different parts of your body. Like so your I didn't kidney, know. Yeah. your eyes. Okay, so it's never also attitude, uh, attitudes yeah. towards women that are negative where they're told they have chronic fatigue or fibromyalgia exactly. or Epstein Barr or. Yeah, I hear this all the time. I, I know a, a 24 year old and she literally cannot get diagnosed. She can't get diagnosed. She's like, I just have, they keep telling me I have chronic fatigue. People keep telling me I'm crazy. Like, but I need to see Dr. Wallace. I know, I'm going to send her to Dr. Wallace you. And he'll but clear it's it like all today up. what we're trying to get every woman who, who can't, yeah. you know, get this opportunity right. to see either one of you, you know, like pay attention to your symptoms take these tests, you know, stand up for yourself like you did and say something mm -hmm. is yeah. wrong with me oh, yeah. and you're not going to tell me that I'm crazy oh, yeah. or that do, I'm just do, tired all the time. Do you know that 80% of all the rheumatology fellows in the United States are female now? Good. Good. Right. Good. That's great. <laughs> but look at the world, world's best one is you. And we're so lucky to have these amazing men too. So I'm yes. just going to say, we talk a lot about oh, women on this yes, podcast. Yes. But and you guys too. So. Yes, Dr. A is my, she's yeah. my OBG too. Oh, she has right. some fantastic I things with me. I send you to her. So yes, Tony, exactly. Can, can yeah, I, exactly. I know yes. you're going to, you've given us so much time, but I just want to geek out for you. You're, you're getting ready. You're going back to Vegas to do, back will to you Vegas. tell me a little bit about I'm what you're excited. doing? I'm excited. I'm so excited. So hyped about it. My, myself and Cedric the Entertainer, oh. we're going back to uh, Vegas and we're doing a love and laughter tour. 
That's going to be amazing. Um, which is really good. It really, what, what's so wonderful about it is Cedric, when I told him I had lupus and I can work, this it's going to be very difficult for you to do an hour and a half, two hours a night. It's going to be really hard. We're not going to deny that to you. And he said, we should do something together. Oh, my so God. So him just lifting that burden off of me. And his mom, unfortunately, passed the lupus complications. So it's something dear to his heart. He's like, Tony, we can do this. You're going to be fine, Tony. I got you. We'll be fun. We're going to have a good time. And so we're, the show is very clever. It's not like I'm going first and then him or vice versa. It's like Sonny and Cher meets Tony and Cedric. So it's like seven <laughs> We're going. You and I are awesome. going. We're so coming to me. Vegas. I'm coming. I'm in Vegas. Oh, I got you're you. so sweet. It's super cool. It was really clever how the director brought it together. It was really creative. And it's like a show. It's a show. Well, yeah. I remember seeing you. I'm going to this. I'm gonna totally geek out on this. You wore a Tom Ford white Cut out dress. Oh, yeah. Do you remember I'll that break dress? My heart. I was twelve then. Uh, you were <laughs> you were at least twelve and a half. Exactly. But you looked so beautiful. Yes. But that was one of the biggest. I mean, I'm just yeah. a fashion geek. So that one yeah. of the biggest fashion moments. Honestly, it was, it was incredible. It was a big moment. Is it true that you were discovered singing at a gas station? True story. In Tell Annapolis, us. Maryland, at Amico, Double A. MCO. Yes. <laughs> if you remember that, I'm taking us back. And That's you were just great. singing, yeah. and somebody. How old were you? I was twenty, twenty, almost twenty two. I was at a gas station pumping gas. I was a student at Bowie State University. I went to be a teacher. Went to college to be a teacher, but not really. I wanted to be a singer, <laughs> but that was plan B. And my dad went to Bowie State University, very traditional. So I went to the same college as my dad. And I was getting gas one day. And this guy, a gas attendant, came up to me and said, are you a singer? I probably was singing something. And I'm thinking, this is a line. What a terrible line. And he said, no, I'm a producer. I'm a real producer. And I would love for you to come to my house and do demos. And I'm thinking, you work at Amico. How are you a producer? <laughs> Which is really jaded to say. I mean, not a nice thing to say. But sometimes you have to take chances in life mm -hmm. because he turned out to be a real producer. He's the guy who co-wrote the song, Girl, You Know It's True by Millie Vanilli. True no story. way. True story. <laughs> And he was working at the gas station because the song had just hit big in the in Europe. It was just coming to America. Oh so my late. god! And he was a real producer. And from him, from that situation, oh, my whole life. Somebody changed. wanted this to happen. Yes, right. Absolutely. The universe put it all the, together. The universe so, did. How yeah. do you feel today? Today is a is a better day. Yesterday was not a good day. I'm not going to lie. Yesterday was not, but today is a better like, day. What so, symptoms? Yay. What happened? Yes. What were you feeling yesterday? Um, I was very fortunate enough not to catch COVID. But when I don't feel good, I imagine that's how people feel who have COVID because I feel achy. It's like an ache in my body. Your whole body. Um, my achy. body was achy and a little chest tightness a little bit. But I'm used to that part. But it was a little more than usual. And I have the tachycardia, so that was a yeah. little racy last night. But so much better today, which means tomorrow is going to be an even better day. Amazing. See, that's yeah. I mean, that's honestly, <laughs> yes. you are the best. Thank you so much, thank both you of guys. you, for being thank here. You. We honestly can't thank you enough. So thank you're you. going to help a lot of women today. And men, yes. anybody else listening? Every, anyone yeah, that has men lupus. Get lupus well, yeah. well, let's say yeah, that they do. Um, about 10% of patients with lupus are males. And males often have more severe lupus mm -hmm. than females. Really? There was a study done at Columbia University 30 years ago where they looked at all the miscarried fetuses of lupus patients, and they found that 70 to 80% of the miscarried fetuses were males, and they proposed that males with lupus weren't even born. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. I didn't know that. But then we know that estrogen is pro-inflammatory. And so yeah. it's, it's much more complicated. Can you pass lupus to your uh, newborn? There's something called neonatal lupus, yes. which is usually mm -hmm. uh, with the SSA antibody, because that's an antibody that crosses the placenta and goes to the fetal pacing mechanism. But that's very rare. There's only like... There's fewer than a thousand cases a year in the United States. Well, I have one question before we let you go because I know you're so busy. But what about menopause and when the estrogen drops? Does does it change with lupus? Yes, um, menopause is uh, it makes lupus better. So we tell my mm. women in their 40s and 50s that lupus is like a good wine; it gets better with age. Oh, that's great to know. And and HRT, do you recommend not to do that with lupus? Okay, so as Thais knows, um, the amount of hormones in a in HRT is only twenty percent of what's in a birth control pill. So when you're in the HRT range, you're usually okay. Correct. Okay. As for especially if you're at risk for forming clots. 
and the patient really needs. I mean, Dr. Wallace, for patients who are at risk for forming clots, I sometimes hesitate to give them HRT. I might go to a patch because you're less likely to form clots with a hormone patch than the pill. Sometimes you give them aspirin with it. Right. But yeah, usually, but usually you have to put them on a baby aspirin because yeah. you don't want them to get have clots. But for other patients who are not at risk, you can give them a combination patch. Well, I'm so. just so happy that somebody has said something positive about menopause and how <laughs> that is the one yes, amazing yes, thing yes. about going through menopause. Yes. <laughs> Your lupus gets better. Your lupus Yay! gets better. And then Dr. A, she's done so much to help me. That's why I mentioned, does this work down here with lupus? Because she helped fix that. Oh, she helped fix I that for you. me. Yes, I can fix she everything. She helped fix that. <laughs> she did. So, so that's important. That's important for the listeners. Like, yeah. we, you know, y- you need, th- a lot of other things are happening at the same yes. time. It's not just feeling, you know, like, so to have a great doctor also helping you with your hormones and, and regulating that. So that was a great thing. Thank you for bringing that, that up I and sharing to talk that. About okay. that. Yeah, so I'm good to go now. Woo-hoo. You're good yeah. to go. Thank you so <laughs> much, right, Tony. Tony. We Thank so you appreciate guys. it. I this was amazing. This is heartwarming. Thank you for coming. I know how busy you are. Never too busy for friends and family. (laughs) We're so grateful to have a few more minutes with just Dr. Wallace to discuss lupus and its impact on pregnancy and reproductive issues linked to autoimmune diseases. But before that, we're going to properly introduce him and his accomplishments, and there are many. Dr. Daniel Wallace is a board-certified internist and rheumatologist, a clinical professor of medicine at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. He is the associate director of the Rheumatology Fellowship Program at Cedar sinai Medical Center, where he also serves on the Board of Governors. Dr. Wallace's practice includes caring for 2,000 lupus patients, the largest lupus cohort in the United States. He's authored nearly 450 peer-reviewed manuscripts, 30 book chapters, and eight textbooks on autoimmune diseases. And I thought I was busy. (laughs) Me too. That is quite a resume. Oh my God. You are the, the, the expert in lupus, and we're so lucky to have you today. Thank you so much for being here today. A lot of young women with the diagnosis of lupus are scared to get pregnant. What do you say to a young girl with lupus who wants to get pregnant? Okay, first of all, 85% of all pregnancies in the United States are successful. And with lupus, it's 70%. There is really two types of lupus. There's organ-threatening and non-organ-threatening. Organ-threatening meaning heart, lung, kidney, liver, brain, or bone marrow. And those are the individuals that have a hard time. Patients with the 50% of lupus patients who are tired or achy, have low-grade fever, swollen glands, they usually do very well with uh, pregnancy. There are some flares during the first trimester, but after that, once the uh, placenta makes cortisone, the fetal adrenal gland makes cortisone, and the mother's adrenal gland makes cortisone, lupus usually does well afterwards, unless towards the very end they develop a preeclampsia or or HELP syndrome. So it's it's multifaceted. But most of the problems people with lupus has are the medications that they're taking for the disease. So there are certain lupus medicines that are teratogenic or... Uh, can what does ca- teratogenic mean? <laughs> the teratogenic can cause fetal abnormalities. Oh, okay. And uh, certain medications can lower the blood counts. But lupus patients are usually normally fertile. Okay, they are. So it's just really after they get pregnant, they have to worry about it. The, so it's not it's, about it's getting pregnant. It's all these ed- mitigating factors. If th- if they are inflamed, it's hard to get pregnant. So if the disease is active, it's harder to get pregnant. But if the disease is only minimally active or not really active, it's usually they have uh, normal fertility. Do you um, do you start or do you recommend all lupus patients to go on baby aspirin? during pregnancy because of that risk of preeclampsia? That, that's later on, but there are two types of issues with lupus in pregnancy. There's those who cannot get pregnant at all, and there's those who cannot keep a pregnancy. And most of the issues deal with those who cannot keep a pregnancy. The most common reason why a lupus patient cannot keep a pregnancy 
is structural and mechanical, what you treat, endometriosis and fibroids. Uh, the second most uh, common would be, um, in addition to structural, would be hormonal, a hormonal imbalance. And many lupus patients are on hormonally mediated medications. Third most common would be genetic. And the fourth most common is immunologic. So immunologic is the fourth most common. It's actually uh, the most interesting. So if we're talking about that, there's two subsets of lupus reproductive failures. The first is inflammation. And the second is a hypercoagulable state, or what I would call sticky blood. What's that? So explain that. So sticky blood is when you throw a blood clot into the placenta um, and cause a uh, miscarriage. So there are many antibodies uh, that are phospholipid antibodies, antibodies to phosphorus and fat, which make up most of the cell membrane. And uh, patients with phospholipid antibodies about a third of them have a miscarriage, and they have a greatly increased uh, risk. So those are the ones we do a, a greater workup, and the management of it involves uh, when they have a miscarriage, the, mis the clots usually f are in an artery or are in a vein. If they're in an artery, uh, then we use baby aspirin. There's a small group that are sensitive to aspirin, but most of the time we can buy with baby aspirin. In a vein, uh, we use different forms of heparin. Uh, we cannot use warfarin or coumadin in patients who are pregnant. It's, uh, it's, it's teratogenic and it's not advisable. But for those who have uh, need to be anticoagulant, historically, we used to use regular heparin. I remember using it for years. Uh, but more recently, they came out with DOAX or uh, oral anticoagulants, but they really don't work very well in lupus. So we use Lovenox. Lovenox is a subcutaneous injection that is given usually uh, once a day if one has the antibodies but has never had a miscarriage or twice a day if one has had uh, a miscarriage. And it, it is not only, it differs from regular heparin in that um, it's actually anti-inflammatory. It was shown as early as the 1920s that uh, these forms of heparin actually treat inflammation. So they kill two birds with one stone. In addition to that, to treat the inflammation, we often use steroids. But there's a group of people that don't tolerate steroids. There's diabetics. There's people with uh, avascular necrosis or get dead bone. And so sometimes in patients who have uh, pro-inflammatory factors or what we uh, would call subclinical autoimmunity, the women feel fine, they look fine, they're, but in the milieu of pregnancy, they throw, uh, they lose the baby. And when we lose a baby in lupus, uh, about 70% of miscarriages occur in the first trimester. About 15% uh, occur between week 13 and week 18. And about 10 to 15% occur after week 18. So we really concentrate on getting people through the first trimester. So we usually use baby aspirin. If they have certain phospholipid antibodies, uh, we use Lovenox. We also use a drug called hydroxychloroquine or Plaquenil, which is an animal malarial. It was used to treat COVID for a while. It's FDA approved for lupus and rheumatoid. It's a drug that raises the pH of the cell. And when you make an acid cell more basic, you prevent certain types of inflammation. And um, But there's other treatments that we can use, niche treatments, or some of the agents that are used to treat rheumatoid arthritis, such as Enbrel or Humira, which are shots, lower natural killer cells and lower uh, T cell activation, and are sometimes used instead or with uh, corticosteroids. And then lastly, there is a group of people who can't take steroids, so sometimes we use intravenous gamma globulin. So you have a 
there's two two patients, two different patients during pregnancy. You have a patient that comes in and she has lupus and she's inflamed and she wants to get pregnant. What do you do? We treat the inflammation first and we tell them not to try to get pregnant until we under uh, we treat their lupus. Most uh, 50% of lupus is mild and we can get by with uh, basic anti-inflammatories if we have to use steroids off in low doses. We use the antimalarials such as hydroxychloroquine or Plaquenil. And then for those who have more active disease, the 50% who have more active disease, we would use what we call biologics or smart drugs, uh, agents that kill bad cells but not good cells. And what is an example of that? Um, an example of that would be Benlisto or Belimumab, Safnello and Afrolimab, uh, some of the JAK inhibitors such as Rinvoc or Zeljans. And so there's there's a whole, there's about 10 things we could use. Um, lupus is very hard to treat. Um, 80% of lupus is treated by 20% of rheumatologists. Usually in a large practice, there is one person in the practice that does all the lupus because it changes every week and it becomes very complicated. But do you get a, a baseline kidney function on every uh, patient who wants to get pregnant or oh, is yes. pregnant? Yeah, we do complete blood panels. We look for protein in the urine. Right. We do an EKG. Sometimes we do a chest X-ray or an echo to make sure the lungs are okay. We look at the skin and joints. We look at, um, we feel the glands to make sure they're not swollen. Uh, we look for um, evidence of uh, fatigue. And we, we do it generally, you know, lupus is sort of like, you know lupus, you know medicine. It, 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 uh, it's hard to It figure. cross-pollinates to all organs. When I had my kids, I spent so much time worrying about their health. I spent time thinking about what food they eat, if they're getting enough sleep, and if they were getting all the vitamins and nutrients they need. The vitamins we take as adults are not always right for their little bodies. Typically, children's vitamins are basically candy in disguise, filled with two teaspoons of sugar, unhealthy chemicals, and other gummy junk growing kids should never eat. I got super fed up, and a few months ago, I did a deep dive and found Haya vitamins for my kids. Haya is made with zero sugar and zero gummy junk, yet it tastes great and is perfect for picky eaters. And trust me, my kids won't take them if they don't taste good. Haya is pressed with a blend of 12 organic fruits and veggies, then supercharged with 15 essential vitamins and minerals, including vitamin D, B12, C, zinc, folate, and many others to help support immunity, energy, brain function, mood, concentration, teeth, bones, and more. It's non-GMO, vegan, dairy-free, allergy-free, gelatin-free, nut-free, and everything else you can imagine. You get this cool bottle on your first order, and then they send you eco-friendly refills every month. SheMD has worked out a special deal with Haya for their best-selling children's vitamin. Receive 50% off your first order. To claim this deal, you must go to HayaHealth.com slash SheMD. The deal is not available on their regular website. Go to H-I-Y-A-H-E-A-L-T-H dot com slash SheMD and get your kids the full body nourishment they need to grow into healthy adults. One of the main reasons I started SheMD was to learn and grow from the incredible experts I get to interview. I'm always asking for their favorite products. Armor Colostrum comes up again and again. Colostrum, we moms know that word. Colostrum is the first nutrition we receive in life and contains all of the essential nutrients our bodies need in order to thrive. I am always on the lookout for ways to strengthen immunity and gut health, improve my fitness and metabolism, and enhance my skin and hair. Armor Colostrum does this. I'm 51, and a year or two ago, I noticed that my hair just wasn't as strong as it used to be, and my skin seemed thinner. Armor Colostrum reactivates hair growth and glowing skin and stimulates stem cells and collagen production. After taking it for a few months, I noticed a huge difference in my hair and skin. Armor starts with sustainably sourced colostrum from grass-fed cows from their co-op of dairy farms in the U.S. They strictly abide by a calf-first sourcing, only sourcing the surplus supply 
of colostrum after calves receive all the nutrients they need. Their unwavering commitment to quality control is evident throughout the entire process. They go above and beyond industry standards and invest in an expensive auditing and third-party testing to ensure Armor Colostrum meets the highest bar of purity and efficacy. We've worked out a special offer for the SheMD audience. Receive 15% off your first order. Go to tryarmra.com slash SheMD or enter SheMD to get 15% off your first order. That's T R Y. A-R-M-R-A dot com slash she MD. So I have a question. I want to make this very clear. A first trimester pregnant lupus patient. Yes. Do you recommend, let's say it's her first pregnancy and she's older, you know, this happens in my practice all the time and they really don't want to lose the pregnancy. They've gone through IVF or, you know, it's been difficult well, for them to get Well, that's the controversy. Pregnant. Yes. So there, what do you there's, do? There's one guy who was at Cedars for many years, who's now based at UCLA, who will not do anything other than baby aspirin. And you I probably know who know, that is. You, yeah, and seen, I don't agree with that. And I disagree with <laughs> Me him. Me too. So here's the problem. Um, Thais and I go by the mantra of evidence-based medicine, which means you do a double-blind placebo-controlled study and you have a specific outcome. But you can't do that in pregnancy. Right. It's not ethical. You can't get it through an institutional re review board. So you have something called eminence-based medicine, which is I've been doing this for a long time and this is what works. And then there's, um, there's sometimes people who are too greedy and give everybody gamma globulin and make hundreds of thousands of dollars off of it when it's the fourth line drug. Right. So it's sort of like Goldilocks. You don't want to be like Dr. A or Dr. C. You want to be just right in the middle with Dr. B. So tell me if what I'm doing is right. I don't have the heart to see my patients grow through miscarriage. And when they come in with the diagnosis of lupus, I tend to be more cautious and more aggressive at the same time. Right. So I always have them at least during the first trimester on Lovenox. Um, yes. And I start them on baby aspirin, right. definitely, right. Uh, 81 milligrams a day. And I stop it usually right. at 36 weeks of pregnancy because we know it reduces the risk of preeclampsia. Right. Now, if they have antiphospholipid syndrome, then I will continue that. Well, there's Lovenox. those that have antiphospholipid antibodies, but have never had a clot. And there's those that have the syndrome, which means they've had a clot. So there's two, two of types them. of right. those. So with the syndrome, twice a day, um, without it, once a day, but I continue it throughout the pregnancy. Yes, you do it because sometimes you can get complications even postpartum. So you do you do it until at least two. What two I weeks do, afterwards. I stop it if it's a. I usually with my lupus patients, I induce them, so it's controlled. You know, I right. don't like them coming through the door. So usually, if I have a date for induction and they don't have any history of preterm delivery, um, I take the Lovenox all the way to 24 hours before the right. day of induction. If I'm not sure, at 36 weeks, I switch them from Lovenox to heparin, which is right. a, another blood thinner, but it's short. -acting. Acting. Yeah. So they get, you know, you wait six hours and they can, you know. It, it, you, it, can, you can tie, you measure factor 10A levels. Right. And you can right, do right. all sorts of things. But then postpartum, as soon as they deliver, if they're at risk of uh, blood clot formation, right. they need to go back on so, these blood thinners so, for six weeks. Yeah. I usually do it for two, but maybe six. Um, so, yeah. It, it, and then there is... 30% of lupus patients have an antibody called SSA or Rho, which is also the Sjogren's antibody. And those individuals also miscarry and they also have congenital heart block. And that's another group that you, we use hydroxychloroquine, we apherese these people to remove SSA antibody. But how do you know if you have the syndrome or if you have those? Are there tests that you can yeah, take? Yeah, there's what we call a reproductive workup. Okay, so that's what I want to talk about. So yeah. every woman hearing this, a woman that has lupus, wants to get pregnant or is newly pregnant, what are the tests that she should do? Okay. to? Or Ooh, if she's had multiple miscarriages and people can't figure it out, it's almost always. Okay. okay. I think the, what is it, ACOG, the American mm -hmm. College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, 
calls uh, those who have reproductive failures those who've had three miscarriages. And it's a specialized group, but we see them even before then. I can't, who, has, who has the heart to watch someone go through three miscarriages Well, those are the only ones that are eligible up. for, like the IVIG and the Lovenox trials. In order to be on the trial, you have to have right. three. I've had three. I have three miscarriages. And I don't I, have and the I'm heart. And I'm ANA positive, so we'll talk about that later. But I, yeah. mean, I didn't know any of this. You know what I'm saying? Like but this is your doctor hopefully did. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think so. You don't need to know all this. So so we need to also talk about those who don't meet criteria for lupus but have undifferentiated connective tissue disease or what we call subclinical autoimmunity um, that I mentioned before. And there's who have those who have overlap syndrome, Sjogren's syndrome, and other uh, rheumatic diseases such as scleroderma and myositis. Actually, rheumatoid patients tend to do really well with pregnancy paradoxically. But let's, so it's so confusing. So, because it's almost like ALS for brain disease. Right. Like you, you give the term ALS when you can't figure out what else is going on in brain disease. Sometimes I think, right. I mean, I have a parent with, with, with Parkinson's. So, but with a woman either has lupus, trying to get pregnant or newly pregnant, what are the tests? What? How do you figure out what direction you should go? Well, the first thing you do is just a normal internal medicine examination. Sometimes doctors can pick up things on physical exam mm -hmm. that the patient's okay. not aware of or has had for a while and never went to the top of their realization that this is something they should mention mm -hmm. to somebody. But you need a, uh, a CBC, a blood chemistry panel, um, and a urine, and in addition to that, you um, you look at the urine for the kidney. Uh, you do a imaging of the chest or an echo of the heart for the heart and lung. And um, brain involvement is very rare uh, that it, when it's not obvious. And then you get what we call ANA panels, and ANA panels are from, let's say, Quest or LabCorp or Cedars or Mayo Clinic. They We'll do uh, something called an ANA-12, where they look at uh, antibodies. I to have mine right here to go over <laughs> with you later. <laughs> antibodies to the cytoplasm, antibodies to the nucleus, antibodies to platelets, white cells, nerve cells, muscle cells. And we do these, and there's different levels of ANA panels. And then there's antiphospholipid panels. Phospholipid panels are cardiolipin or other non-cardiolipin antiphospholipid antibodies. They're usually uh, negatively charged. The false positive syphilis serology, which has been around for ages, is a positively charged antibody, which is why it, without the phospholipid, it's not usually that important. Um, but we also are the lupus anticoagulant. There, there's lots of clotting times. Mm -hmm. There's lots of different proteins. Protein C, protein S, anti-annexin five. five. Yeah. The, uh, so, do you give these to all your patients that come in with oh, lupus? Oh, hundred percent. Not lupus. If yeah. you come to my office with recurrent miscarriage and no one can figure yeah. it out, that's the first thing I do. Okay. And you'd be surprised how many patients don't have it when they walk in. Yeah, Leiden factor five called? mutation. Right, factor five. I do it all. We call it the mother motherfucker mutation. <laughs> Motherfucker, it sure is. Yeah. You know, I had a patient once with a factor five. Basically, they're uh, predisposed to make forming clots. This woman had six miscarriages. Yeah. She walked into my office, and as my medical assistant was presenting her case, she was six weeks pregnant. I'm like, I know what the diagnosis is. I'm going to save this baby. Yeah. I walk in, I say hi to her, and I'm like, I know what your diagnosis is. She's like, what do you mean? I've been to all these doctors. I'm like, no, yeah. no, no. I delivered uh, three of her children. Oh, wow. Yeah. Great. And all I did was start her on blood love, thinner. That's all I did. Yeah, love. And what is that test called? She was factor five. She had a factor five mutation that predisposed her to blood clot formation. Most of those people don't have lupus, but they miscarry a lot. Okay. Okay. So, but again, I just because you guys know exactly what you're talking so, about, I just want to make it just very clear for our listeners. So, what happens is you need flow through the placenta. Mm -hmm. right? From the mom to the baby. Mm -hmm. Anytime you cause blood clots in those vessels, right? right? right. 
the baby can't grow. Yeah, my mother had a blood clot. She was on heparin back No, in the but day. these are in the placenta. Okay. So if it happens early during first trimester, you'll miscarry. If it happens mm-hmm. at 28 weeks, you'll end up with a fetal demise, which is so traumatic. So I'm asking one more time. So what is that test called? Because I want all the women it's, hearing. It's not just one test. It's an anti-phospholipid panel. It, it's a phospholipid panel. Right. If you want, panel. we're going to put it on right. our podcast, put, put it on the on website. The, on the website. So everyone who's had, it's a Work up for a recurrent miscarriage. Obviously, we'll go through okay. another episode. There right. are other causes of recurrent right. miscarriages, but this is one that you need to have. And this doctor sitting across from me is, are you the best in the world? You are the best in the world. You are the best in my world. <laughs> uh, I try to help. So, no, well, so now you have this lupus patient. You do a full autoimmune workup. Um, they get pregnant. It, you know, obviously, you have the choice of putting them on Lovenox. You start them on baby aspirin. If they, if you want to lower their inflammation, you start them on prednisone. Yeah, That's so what we in, do. In a car wash, we call it the works. The works. You give them the works. We give them the, <laughs> the works. <laughs> we don't take any chances because these agents are generally very safe. Even 15 milligrams of prednisone for the first trimester in divided doses is is generally safe yes. for about 80 to 90 percent. God, it's amazing. You guys are amazing. I mean, I think of all, I mean, it makes me want to cry because I do think of all these women that go through miscarriages in this country and they just keep having them and having them and having them and having them and they just don't have yeah. the access to doctors I, like you. And you know, I just had a patient who had five embryos, lost four of it, came to me as a new patient. Obviously, the first question I asked is, where's your autoimmune? Did you do blood thinners? No, no. Yeah. That's what's I heartbreaking. Mean, uh, That's why I want people to listen. I'm going to have it on our podcast, okay. the workup for it, the blood test It'll you need. be on our website. You, you don't need to memorize it right now, but I, I, know, just want you, I just want you guys to listen for now to what Dr. Wallace is teaching us. Dr. Wallace, can you, so now you have to, we passed the first trimester. Um, and uh, I just wanted to add the urine test that you were mentioning is a 24-hour urine collection for well, it's protein. It's a urine protein creatinine, creatinine ratio. The, yes, correct. If necessary, a 24-hour 24 24 year. Hours. We want to make sure they don't have protein in the urine. A third of all lupus patients have uh, kidney involvement. Right. There's 200,000 people with lupus in the United States. 80,000 have some form of kidney involvement. So we brought up something a minute ago that the test, and again, I have mine and it says ANA positive. And I remember I called you because I, I, yeah. I found you through a friend and you were like, do you have any symptoms? I was like, I have lupus, I'm ANA positive. Uh, well, How do you yeah, diagnose okay. lupus? So ANA positivity is seen in 13.7% of the United States. Okay, that makes me feel One better. person in seven has an ANA. Okay. But only 10% of those individuals have an autoimmune disease. So like everybody with Hashimoto's thyroiditis has a low titer ANA. Most people with rheumatoid arthritis have an ANA. Relatives or first cousins or nephews and nieces have ANAs. So um, people with scleroderma myositis, vasculitis have ANA. So if you have an ANA, it's a starting point towards doing a more detailed autoimmune workup. You, you, want to, uh, you want to look for inflammatory bowel disease. You want to look for celiac disease. Mm-hmm. Uh, the biggest group is Hashimoto's, thyroiditis, or Graves' disease outnumber are the most common cause of ANA in the United States. And what is what are the differences? Can you say the difference between like what Hashimoto is versus lupus versus? Well, autoimmune disease is what happens when the body becomes allergic to itself. Right. It's the opposite of cancer. It's the opposite of HIV. It's where the body makes antibodies to its own tissue. And for every one person with lupus, there's five to ten with something called UCTD, which means undifferentiated connective tissue disease, which means you don't feel well. You have an antibody, you respond to an anti-inflammatory, but you don't meet criteria. You can't be in a clinical trial or for demographic studies, you can't be part of it. But we, we, that's uh, half of what we treat. What happens to a lupus patient in the second and third trimester? How do you follow them? Okay, so once you get to week 13, you can usually stop prednisone by week 18. You continue the aspirin. Some people continue the aspirin till week 28 to for the fetal uh, patent ductus arteriosus to uh, to close, which is part of the uh, heart valves. Um, you uh, 
can usually back off because, as I mentioned, the body makes uh, cortisone, so usually do pretty well. And then things are really quiet for a while, and then in 5 to 10% at the very end, as uh, Thais mentioned, we have preeclampsia, we have HELP syndrome, we have uh, coagulopathies or kidney involvement and bl blood pressure issues where we have to watch them. But most people do very well. I mean, growth-restricted uh, babies, small babies, uh, high blood pressure, HELP syndrome. So we see complications and uh, sometimes we need to deliver these patients a little bit earlier. In my practice, I like to deliver them by 39 weeks so I don't wait for the preeclampsia and HELP syndrome and everything else to show right, up. Yeah. Dr. Ross, can you give us five takeaways for lupus? Lupus is an autoimmune disease that affects probably in the spectrum almost a million people in the United States. And it needs to be taken seriously and it needs to be managed very, very carefully. Are there any supplements you could take? Some of the herbs and spices and nuts and berries that are used to manage lupus that help Maybe fish or fish oil, uh, turmeric, uh, but most of them really don't make much of a difference. So it's medicine. You there mean. is no lupus diet. There's a lot of work being done with the microbiome that will be important in the next few years. But right now, we don't have the magic bullet. If there's one test everyone should take to see if they have lupus, what would that be? The anti-nuclear antibody or the ANA. Does exercise help with lupus? There is isometric and isotonic exercise. Isotonic is uh, not good if you're inflamed because it's uh, tennis, bowling, golf, weightlifting, rowing, and it can inflame the joints. But isometric is very good, Pilates, Tai Chi, yoga, stretching, strengthening, as well as things that deal with the sympathetic nervous system, such as prayer, relaxation techniques. Does stress obviously causes? Yes, your lupus. the head bone is connected to the immune bone. <laughs> the head bone <laughs> is connected to the immune bone. And the last question is what are the five symptoms of lupus? Fatigue, aching, low grade fevers swollen glands, and sometimes shortness of breath. I just want to make sure our listeners know that I will have a list of blood tests that they need to take to their doctor on our podcast website um, that will list all the tests they need in order to diagnose an autoimmune disorder. Like I was explaining, a lot of patients with recurrent miscarriages have an underlying autoimmune disease. So if you've had two or three miscarriages and um, your doctors don't know why, it's a good place to start. Obviously, there are different reasons why people have right. miscarriages. It could but be chromosomal. Great. It could be... Um, anatomical, it could be... Right. Uh, it's not always lupus, but it's important that you have the action plan of what to do if you've, you know, let's check that right off the box. Yes, definitely. Dr. Alibadi, what happens when a pregnant patient comes into your office? What does she need to look out for if she's got lupus? So the first thing I do, I contact her lupus rheumatologist. In this case, with my patients, it's almost always Dr. Wallace. It's important to know where your patient is starting, what her symptoms are. Does she have active lupus or is she in remission with her symptoms? That will make a huge difference. Someone who's not pregnant and is trying to get pregnant and her lupus symptoms are pretty active, I would recommend for those patients to hold off from getting pregnancy. I would send them to the rheumatologist first, get their symptoms under control, and then get them pregnant. For patients who come through the door pregnant with lupus, I definitely discuss the case with the rheumatologist. These patients are at a higher risk of miscarriages, so you have to watch them very carefully. I usually discuss the case with their doctor, and I might add baby aspirin, blood thinner, prednisone, or other medications, at least during the first trimester, until they get to about 12 to 13 weeks. But this is different for every single patient. So it's not like every single lupus patient gets all these meds. Baby aspirin, I really like for lupus patients. In general, patients with lupus are at risk of preeclampsia. And we know that if we have these patients take a low-dose aspirin during pregnancy, of course, approved by their physician, 
until 36 weeks, we can reduce the risk of preeclampsia. And do they have to worry about the fetus if you have lupus? Is there some special thing? Yes, that you need to lupus, eat? sometimes depending on um, how active their lupus symptoms are, these patients are at risk of having a fetus with heart disease. So I usually refer these patients to um, high risk OB and I do an early anatomy ultrasound at 16 weeks. We look at the heart. We look at the heart again at 20 to 22 weeks, which is very important. I usually do a fetal echo on these patients. Lupus pregnant patients are at risk of preterm delivery. So sometimes we have to deliver these babies way before 37 weeks because of maternal reasons or because of severe growth restrictions in utero. So there are different reasons why we would But you intervene. have many patients with lupus that you can monitor and have a healthy pregnancy and a healthy baby. Oh, absolutely. We monitor their kidney function when they first start. So let's go back to a patient who walks in um, pregnant with lupus. We do a full blood panel on them. I make sure that their rheumatologist is aware. We do a, fun a kidney function test on them. Usually it's a... Uh, um, protein creatinine ratio in the urine. Sometimes if they have renal disease or kidney disease, I do a 24 hour urine collection to see how much protein they're uh, dumping in their urine. So we get some baseline labs on them. I always send them to a cardiologist because lupus patients tend to have heart disease as you listen to Tony. I did not know that. Yes, it's very common. So I always have a cardiologist see them. If they have any vision problems, I have them see an ophthalmologist. I always have the rheumatologist involved and I always have a high-risk OB doctor uh, managing them with me. Thank you. Okay. That's perfect. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thanks so much for joining us today on SheMD. If you want to own your own health, follow us on social media and subscribe to our show on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. For Dr. Wallace's takeaways, visit SheMDPodcast.com. <laughs>